love is a, it's a, such a funny thing. Um, I love a lot of different things in life. I love uh, every morning at 5 a.m. right now. Why? Because the World Cup's on. Oh, man. This next week, it starts at 7 a.m., so it's kind of nice to get a couple extra hours. But, yes, I'm up watching Japan and Colombia at 5 a.m. every single day. I'm up watching England thrash uh, 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 Panama today and why the USA didn't make it in, and they did. It's just unbelievably sad for me. But regardless, um, I-, I watched it. I-, I-, I love this experience that we get to have and um, be able to be able to watch soccer. Or, but, but you love all of these different things in the world. We love babies when they're born, even when some of them aren't cute. And like, we can admit it here, we're Christians, we're honest people, some babies aren't cute. But but mom and dad, they're not looking at that uncute baby like, oh, you're not that cute yet. They're like, this is the cutest baby. Everybody, grandma and grandpa, everybody loves that baby. Like, we love so many different things in life. But I think one of the most important experiences you can have is being loved. You know, we, we look at this idea of love and this idea of being loved, it's this past tense phrase of a present tense love, and that's exactly who God is, that it's a past tense phrase that he loved you. I mean, um, it, it says in John three sixteen, the New King James Version, for God so loved the world. He loved you. I think sometimes we look at our lives and we think like, how could he love me, but he's always loved you? His love for you does not change. And not only does he love you in a way that that you can't understand and comprehend, but he loves you in a way that he would give his one and only son to die for you. Love is such a place that that you could experience his presence. For God so loved the world, and you're his world. That's who you are. That's what you are. You are God's world. You are his creation that he would give his one and only son begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you're in the room right now and you've never met Jesus before at the end of the service, I'll I'll give you an opportunity to raise your hand and give your life to him. And that, that it's all really summed up in that phrase right there because, you know, the the fundamental point of the gospel is that you are loved exactly where you are. That you're loved. You're so incredibly loved. And I think we skip over moments like this so often. That we think love is for something else or we get so used to the idea that God loves us that we just kind of put it by the wayside. But I want us to sit in that this morning. That you're loved. That you're believed in. That God cares for you. Not for just the potential of who you could be someday. He cares for who you are right here and right now. If you didn't progress just a moment even further in your relationship, he loves you. He desires more of you, but his love doesn't change in the midst of that. Love is this intense, deep feeling. It's this, it's this present tense. Love is this past tense, this idea. And then we're, all, we're, we're always so worried about the present. We, we worry, that does God still love me? I, I mean, how could he love me? He, he hasn't. How could that change? And, and we, we've already given those moments because love people, loved people live in facts, not myths. People who are loved, they live in the fact that they are loved. People who don't know that they're loved, they live in the myths of the potential of love. See, the difference between a fact and a myth, a a, a fact is the concrete. A myth is is something of potential. It may have happened at some point. It it could happen again. But we've got to realize in the midst of today and in your life that you are loved. You're so incredibly loved. That's not changing. There's nothing you can do to move that or gain more of that. That love is always in abundance. I think many of us, we live in a place, in a world, in a time that we forget the sight of the love that we actually have. We get into working really hard and we get into having kids and jobs and different things and we forget the idea and the reality that we are loved. It's this fact that God loves you, and the myth is that God isn't satisfied with you. You you ever feel like that sometimes? God's, I don't read my Bible enough. I don't pray enough. I I, I don't, well, welcome to the team. But like, I think very few of us are raising our hands in the midst of like, yeah, I read my Bible enough. Pray, I don't cease. It's a joke out of the Bible. (laughs) Quoting scripture right now in a comedic fashion. 
from the, uh, from the great theologian George Costanza. Um, it's an incredible moment where Jerry asks him, Seinfeld, asks him, uh, you know, you've never told anybody that you love someone? And George goes, I told a dog once. I think it's this idea that we just don't know what to do with love sometimes. Like, like we're very confused by it. We, we, we work really hard in it. And, and loved people, they, they respond in love. And hurt people respond in hurt. I, I think it's just kind of plain and simple. Hurt people don't respond in love. Hurt, hurt people respond in hurt. Loved people respond in love. Like, like you wonder why people love you unconditionally sometime when, when you've stabbed in the back, when, when you, you show up late all the time. It's because they know that they're loved, that they know that this world and what we're living in isn't something in a, in a way that, that they should just sit in and have. Like, like loved people, they, they, they respond in love. Loved people care about immigration. Love people care about, like, like, like Black Lives Matter. Love people care about equality. Love people care about those things because humanity is far more important than a border. Humanity sees beyond those things and protection of just where we live. Like, like, that's what I see. I don't see a country. I see humanity. Loved people respond caring for humanity and making sure that children are with their loved ones regardless of political opinions. Because you're loved, because God doesn't see borders, God sees hearts. Do we realize that? Yes? That's not our heads. Well, loved people respond out of love. Hurt people respond in hurt. Hurt people respond in fear of what could be taken from them, opposed to what's being taken from others. Loved people, they're mysterious because they always continue to just love. I love love. Lovable people are even easier to love. I love a good lovable person, someone that you really want to spend time with. And I I think what's difficult is sometimes we don't spend enough time with lovable people. And, and, you know, loved people care about those things. And this incredible story in in the midst of uh, um, the prodigal son. I love this story, but I I want to read the story of Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through, uh, um, what are we reading here, through 24. I want to read it from the father's point of view. If you have a Bible with you, open it up. If not, it'll be on the Bible in the sky behind me in just a moment. And let's read this story, but let's, let's read it in a way from the father's point of view. I think the two sons get so much of the emphasis so often in this story. The prodigal son obviously being the main character, the uh, other son, the hardworking son doing the things that are right, being the secondary. But this father... I love his response. See, he's hurt by his son. If you're a father, have you ever been hurt by your son before? Not physically, not like that moment that they jump on you with two knees. Why do kids do that? It just hurts so every single time. You're never ready. And you, <gasps> I had hernia surgery a couple weeks ago. And Beckham jumped on me. And I'm like, <gasps> that was my exact reaction. And I go, Beckham, do you remember that dad has that big cut? He goes, oh, yeah, how is it? Can I see it? <laughs> Kid's a dirtbag. Um, he's hurt by his son. He's devastated by your son. Have your kids ever let you down before? He's devastated by his son. But he responds in love and compassion. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He responds in love and compassion. Luke chapter 15 Starting in verse 11, reading out of the New Living Translation, it reads this. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told told this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. That's the most awkward conversation ever. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About, about the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into, the, into his field to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. When he finally came to a census, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. 
and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as your hired servant. So he returned home and watched the actions of a father. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still long off, his father saw him coming, filled with compassion. He ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But, father, but his father said to the servants, Quick. Bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Give a ring, uh, get a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and now is returned in life. He was lost, but now he is found. So, he, they, they, so the party began. Oh, I love that part. So the party began. And I think what you got to remember, like, Culturally, what would have happened in, in those times, if you would have betrayed your family, what would have happened is culture would have given you the opportunity to stone your son, to, to disown your son, for him to come and not even recognize him as his son, for him to become a servant, for him to just say, I don't even know who you are. See, the reality is, is culture will lead you to death, but, 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 but the gospel will lead you to life. And so he responded with the compassion of the gospel. He didn't respond with, with the discipline of, 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 of what culture told him. And so often we look at the people we look at people through culture's eyes instead of through the gospel's eyes. We look at people and say, oh, they deserve that. Oh, they need to get that. Oh, that's exactly what comes to them. And I think that's what people who struggle with the idea of being loved, that's how they respond. That people should get what they deserve opposed to getting grace and mercy just like you have received. That every single one of us have received that. See, the law was going to kill him, but love saved him. Do you realize that moment in the story? That, that the law was going to kill him. But the gospel, it saved him. Compassion, it saved him. We've got to see people through the eyes of compassion. We've got to see people through the eyes of the gospel, not through the eyes of culture that you didn't matter. You, you, you're you not who I thought you'd be. You, you, you're not my type of person. You, you know what? You, you, you're, you're just this. Instead of seeing people the way, through the eyes of culture, let's see people through the eyes of the gospel, through the eyes of love and compassion, that, that we've got to see people like the father saw his son. He sprinted to him, something he's not even allowed to do in that culture. He ran. In such a way, see, kindness, it leads to repentance. Think about how often in our lives that we, we, we've wanted people to repent for something or, or say that they're sorry, but you didn't bring kindness, you brought anger. Has anger ever resolved problems? Anger doesn't resolve, but kindness, it wins. Kindness is like the, the greatest thing that you could ever bring in the midst of that story. Uh, I, I love that moment. I, I want to give three different things that this father responds. See, loved people do these three things. Loved people do these things. The first one is this. Loved people, they, they forgive. Loved people forgive. I love that about loved people. They forgive first. It says this, so he returned to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Now, I remember um, growing up, see, I, I, I didn't grow up with social media. I didn't grow up with iPads and iPhones and, and Kindles and things like that. So I grew up with plywood and logs. If you know where I'm going with this, you, you grew up in my neighborhood as well. I remember, like, like, we didn't have jumps. We made jumps. Okay, I had a 10 speed, 12 speed, and sometimes it had no speed because I hit that jump so hard and my chain fell off. And, you know, I can repair a bike, but I can't change my oil. Like, 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 like well, that's what we grew up doing. And I remember, like, 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 like there's that moment, like, like, my dad preached last week and, and he referenced me as Eddie Haskell offensively, but it's true. And so, like, 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 I can get, um, I can get people to do things, if you will. Like, I, I, I can convince you. And so I got my best friend, Walker. His name's Chris, um, no Texas Ranger. And, um, and, and so we, here we, you, you know, he's over at my house. We're running around. And I'll never forget the day we, we took a log, you know, because we had a wood fireplace. And that was my job with the family. I always made sure the fire was going. I always made sure that we had dry firewood and, we, you know, went out with my dad. But, you know, um, we, we found this plywood that my dad had doing, been doing a project. And we found this log. And we said, um, one nail is going to do it. Like, that's all we're going to need. And this is going to be as sturdy as, you know, we could really build, right? And so, you know, we pulled this piece of plywood over and we grabbed this one log and no joke, just with a hammer, we put this nail, you know, through this log. Raise your hand if this was your childhood. Raise your hand. This is what you did. Amen. Like, you know, that's why we have scars. 
these iPad kids, they're not going to have scars. We're going to have scars. And so like, you know, here, you know, and so I'm like, he's like, who's going to go first? And I was like, well, I think you're the better biker than I am. So it's probably, it doesn't make the most sense, like, if you, like, you have the nicer bike, and, like, you, you, you should do it first. And he's like, I, I don't know if this is sturdy. Seems good to me. And he's like, and he's the more cautious one. He's an engineer. I'm not. I mean, like, like, like so, like, like, he's, like, his, little, you know, like, 12-year-old engineer brain's like, no, I'm going to die. And I'm like, no, no, you'll be fine, bro. Like, you're, you're, you're the better biker than we are. And so all of a sudden, you know, he comes ripping around the corner, and, and we're like, you're going to want to hit it probably pretty fast. You don't want to hit the, If you hit it slow, you're, you're not, you're not going to make it. And he's like, you're, you're right. And so I'm like, absolutely. Like, this is what, and like, like, like th- th- there's this uncertainty raising in him. There's this uncertainty uh, about what, what, what's going to happen here in, in the midst of this moment. And as he's coming around the corner, like, have you ever seen someone like do something extreme with uncertainty? What, what happens? They get hurt every single time. An engineer walker comes ripping around that corner, certain and then the closer he's getting to it, he's, like, becoming less and less certain, like, the closer he gets to it. And all of a sudden, like, by the time he's, like, pumping his brakes, and he hit that in this plywood, it must have been, like, you know, like, I don't know, eighth inch. Because it bent, and his tire just, boom, just hits it. And, like, he just flips over the handlebars, and he's laid out, and I'm like, oh, oh, man. And, like, and I know the story. I know instantly, like, Kyle, you convinced him to do it. I'm like, uh-uh. He's a lone wolf over here. And he's like, but, 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 like, when you live in uncertainty, you can't commit. But when you live in certainty, you can commit. And every single one of us need to be certain that we are loved by God, but not live in uncertainty. Because if you live in uncertainty, you'll have a lukewarm heart for following him. You'll have a lukewarm heart, and, and you'll, do, you'll, you'll take steps for him. You'll take moments with him. You, you, you'll, you'll take a Sunday with him, but not the rest of the week. When you have certainty that God loves you, you are certain to love people around you. Amen? When you're certain that God loves you, that people can stab you in the back, and you can still forgive them. Doesn't mean you don't learn. You're not stupid. You're certain. Well, you, you have those moments in life. But are you certain that God loves you? Are you certain that you're lovable? Are you certain that he sent his son to die on a cross for you? Really, it's like, do, do you have faith that those things are happening? Do you have faith that he's going to save you? Can you forgive those who hurt you? Forgiving people who hurt you is like the hardest thing in the world. Because you just don't want to. Like, that's all it comes down to. It's like, I just don't want to because they hurt me. And I'd rather hold, it's easier to hold on to hurts than release forgiveness, but it feels better to forgive than to hold on to hurts because then you're burdened by them. You get weighed back. We all know people who are holding on to hurts and people who've released hurts. People who, people who live in hurt walk around with knives facing themselves because they know that someone's just going to stab them. It's like Caesar walking into the room and being like, you can have a knife and you can have a knife and everybody can have a knife. But when you walk in the room and just know, yeah, sometimes I'm going to get hurt, but I know my God's never going to hurt me. When you're certain of that, it doesn't make it okay for other people to hurt you, but it makes it okay for you to forgive them. It makes it okay to have moments like that, that you, you forgive as you've been forgiven, that you live in forgiveness. Live in forgiveness. I love, loved people forgive. Loved people forgive. Luke chapter 6, verse 28 says this, bless, who, bless those who curse you, pray for those who hurt you. Pray for those who hurt you. I even recognize this moment in the Bible in Colossians chapter 13, uh, 3, verse 13. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. So that we forgive each other just as God forgave us. Because like we, we, we look in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 through 15. And don't be fooled by this text. Read this text as it is. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to fit, forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. We, do we realize that? Like so often we, 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 we like God owes it to me for, to, for, for me to forgive, for, for him to forgive me but I don't know it to anybody to forgive them. Well, the scripture says the exact opposite, that if we forgive, God will forgive us. 
That we don't live in this limbo of unforgiveness. We live with this open heart. God doesn't exist. God doesn't forgive if we don't forgive. Uh, how do you forgive like Jesus? And, you know, I think, so, so we have that moment of like, like love people forgive. I love, love people forgive. Love people are also generous. I love the Father's response here. Because I think it might be the opposite of sometimes of the response that you had from your father. Opposite of sometimes the response that as fathers we have for our children. That in the midst of his son coming back, he gives him this embrace and he hugs him and he kisses him and he runs to him. But not only is he excited for his presence, but he's excited to be generous. He says, but his father said to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. I love, um, I love those, those car restoration shows. I love, and I'm like, I'm not a car person, except for like, I really want a V-Dub Westphalia. Like, if you have one, you want to give it to me, roughly between years of 76 to 79, because then the kitchen's on the side. Like, I really love those. But other than that, like, like I'm not a car person, but I like watching the process of the restoration. Like, I love going to old car shows and seeing these cars. And but one of my favorite things that I notice from those cars when they're restoring an old car is it's never about what the car used to be. It's always about what the potential of what it could be. Do you ever recognize that? These old guys are sitting around and they're looking at it and they're like, oh man, this, this was my first car. Oh, this 68 show. Oh, this. Oh, I remember my buddy had one of these. And they begin to talk about what the potential of bringing it back to what it used to be. See, I think so often we look at our relationship with God and we, see, and, and we think God just sees us as this rusty old Shelby. But God sees you as the potential of what you are, and he knows where you are, but he sees the potential of where you could be, the, what, what he's designed you, what he's built you to be, what, what he desires you to be. There's nothing better than that moment. It's never been how, how beat up the car is used to be. It's always about the potential of what it could be, that everyone needs restoration. Everyone needs that generosity and that work. Just the other day, one of the guys in the church, uh, he, he, he's got this old truck, and he pulled it up, and he just began to tell me, oh, I'm going to do this to it, and I'm going to do this to it, and and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this. It was never about the state that it's in right now. It's always about the money that's going to be spent so for the restoration. And the money that's been spent for your life was his son, Jesus, who died for you, who rose from the dead, that he was willing to spend that sacrifice so that you could have life, that there's no financial gain, but there's life gain. When you're forgiven and you are loved, you recognize everybody's potential. I'm such a potential person. I, I, I love people's potential. I love looking at them because I, 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 I'm grace guy. I, love, I have no mercy, don't get me wrong. I ha, but I have like a ton of grace. Like, like we'll give opportunities to people who don't deserve the opportunities and when they don't make it, we we'll always want to bring them grace because God has potential for every single person's life that be generous with potential. Be generous, be grace-filled, love people, like, like care for their needs. See that in your children. Like God's, I recognize that. God sent his best so we can give our best. God was the most generous. Where in your life are you being generous? Where in your life are, are you forgiving others quickly? Like where is that happening for you? Because that's what loved people do. If you're in the room right now and you, you follow Jesus, you raise your hand, you, you, you confess with your mouth and you know him, that you are a loved person. Maybe you don't know him right now and you're here. You are a loved person. But how are we sharing that love? And the third way that we do this that I, I think is amazing and maybe one of my favorite is love people celebrate. The, ba the band's going to come out. We're, we're going to worship one more song. But like loved people, we Celebrate! Can, can, can we like? Can we give like uh, like like a shout real fast? Like everybody just start clapping and say woo! Like come on, come on, give me some of that. Like I love it! Like I love a celebrate! Like like you you'll recognize I'll, I'll come out and like be transitioning a moment. Like everybody, like, let's clap for them. Let's do it! And, and like 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 people are like mm hmm yeah mm hmm that's good. Like no no I like a celebration. I don't want a party. Like um I, I'm learning a lot about myself right now and I really don't like it and um. You ever like learn about yourself? Like you like take like a personality test and you read it and you're like, oh, this is weird. I don't like this. And like we're, we're doing like self-discovery as a staff and it's awful. Um, I even cried this last week. Like what? 
The staff's like, I knew it. I knew they were in there. Sucker. So we took this thing called the Enneagram, and, and it, it, it's great, and I'm learning all about myself, and I'm loving it. And I think one of the most important things about it is that I, I'm learning that I, I'm this, like, I, I, I'm a, partly like I'm this enthusiast. Like, if you come in the room and be like, oh, the service was kind of dull today, I'd be like, oh, I'm like, like, let's make it better somehow. And like, let's all go to Disneyland. We're all going to go to Disneyland. Like, like I would want to make, like, do something, like, just insane like that. I would want to, like, like, change it. But because loved people, they celebrate because they see potential in other people. They live in forgiveness. And so they're, they're, you're not walking around with a knife that someone's going to hurt me. You're always walking around with the potential of what's around you. And when you you see people of potential, you see people that they are loved and believed in, when you care for them, they're going to be like, why are you doing this? And then you get to say, because God loves you. Because everybody needs that love. I, I look at David. I look at David in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. He made himself look like a fool before the Lord. I think we're so reserved about our love. I don't want to offend anybody. Why are we so worried about people's offense? Why are we worried about their destination when they're going to heaven or hell? I just love people so well. But I think first and foremost, like your love. Go ahead and close your eyes. I, 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 love, I love this. Once you embrace who God is in your life, you'll be able to embrace who you are in others' lives. That you're the potential for someone to meet Jesus. You're the potential that your forgiveness and your love and your mercy and your grace and your compassion that may that just be on the tip of your tongue at all times. A person of love, a person of grace, and a person of truth.